Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. Misery and economic hardship are what lies ahead for over 2 million adult consumers of nicotine vaping products and the industry that supports them. If a nationwide flavor ban were to go into effect, which looks all the more likely, following Federal Health Minister Mark Holland's recent press conference and Health Canada's hurried stakeholder consultation on a slate of onerous flavor restrictions that were first introduced in late 2020 and all but shelved in 2021. What's going on here? Joining us today to talk through developments and impacts of a nationwide flavor ban is Sam Tam, president of the Canadian Vaping Association. Sam, it's good to have you back on the show. Thanks, Brett, for having me again. Sam, how concerned should consumers be about the proposed flavor ban? Brett, very concerned. Uh, first off, there are more than 1.3 million adult vapors' lives that are going to be impacted by this proposed uh, flavor ban. Uh, I'm certain that this isn't something that Health Canada wants uh, because this would undermine Canada's tobacco strategy, uh, achieving less than 5% smoking rate by 2035. To me, this is politically motivated for the wrong reasons. It's not in the best interest of public health and to Canadians. We'll dive into the specifics of the flavor ban in just a moment, but first, this past week, Federal Health Minister Mark Holland held what I'd call an extraordinary press conference where he got quite emotional in response to the sale and marketing of a nicotine pouch product called Zonic, which is approved by Health Canada under the natural health product category. Let's have a listen. I was with Heart and Stroke when we dealt with the issue of vaping. And there were many voices at that time when information was uncertain who said, let this exist as a cessation tool. Don't take action. The result of that, unfortunately, was that the tobacco industry was able to addict a whole new cohort of young people who had no exposure to nicotine to something that's absolutely deadly for their health. It has had very injurious outcomes for our health system. We cannot allow that to happen again. I would say to the tobacco companies that continued to look for ways to use loopholes to addict people to their products, get away. Stay the hell away from our kids. I'm seeking authority to restrict products so that they are solely for the purposes of cessation. We shouldn't be seeing flavors that are targeting kids. Flavors like you know, winter berry splash or whatever, tropical fruit, whatever that they're putting out there. I'm seeking these authorities immediately in the conversations I'm having with provinces and territories for all cessation products, that the only flavors that should exist should be for the purposes of promoting cessation. These are kids who have no exposure to tobacco or nicotine before. That's entirely unacceptable. Hopefully you can hear my voice and my intention. I don't ever want to go through this again. What we saw happening in vaping all the illness, the death, the sickness. So Sam, uh, Minister Mark Holland, I mean, the end of that bite there, vaping, sickness, illness, disease. I, is he really talking about the same products that we use? First of all, um, what he set up in regards to illness, death and sickness in regards to vaping, um, that's actually not factual, right? Uh, I'm not sure if the minister's uh, where, he's, where is he getting his evidence from? Uh, first off, um, there hasn't been anyone that died from vaping nicotine um, in Canada. In regards to illness and sickness, uh, if he's referring to Volley, uh, let me remind the minister that it has nothing to do with vaping nicotine, but illicit THC vapes that were laced with vitamin E acetate. Um, and th that was an illicit product. Uh, and quite frankly, um, if the minister bans flavor, not only is this going to impact 1.3 million lives, but this is going to send the entire legal, re highly regulated vape industry here in Canada to the illicit market. We're going to put our youth at even more risk. Sam, you mentioned that when he was at heart and stroke is when he observed these things with regard to vaping. What, is, what does that mean? It's interesting, Brett. Uh, you know, I, as far as I could uh, recall, I mean, when uh, when the minister was with Heart and Stroke, um, you know, th there was no approach in regards to harm reduction, right? I, I don't think. Uh, I mean, we can just look at his message, right? He keeps talking about flavors for cessation. 
Uh, what exactly is flavor for, for cessation? Because I, I, I think what's really important is someone that smokes, they do not want to go back to the same flavors that they're trying to get themselves away from. Um, and many of those that have been given an option to choose the different types of flavors, and you know, they normally choose um, any flavors other than tobacco, mint, and menthol. Um, what's really important is to look at, you know, the industry knows this very well, Uh, and to look at the sales data, I mean, the government of Canada has sales data of what adults are buying, right? Whether through excise, whether through the vaping products reporting regulation, it clearly shows that adults are choosing flavors other than tobacco, mint, menthol, right? And the numbers are staggering as high as 90%. People enjoy flavors no matter what age you are. Well, absolutely. I mean, all we have to do is uh, why don't we uh, look into going into our our local LCBO? Um, what it what what uh, when adults go in? I mean, they're exposed to all types of flavors that they like. What what it makes sense for the LCBO to only sell beer and vodka, straight flavorless flavors? Do we feel that adults are going to only choose those flavors? Absolutely not. Uh, I think what's really important to highlight is it's not the legal industry that's targeting kids. Those that are targeting kids are criminals, organized crime groups, illicit trade. And I have a lot of experience in dealing with this issue, uh, Brett. You know, I had the privilege to uh, provide training to bylaw enforcement. You know, some of the uh, people that they're going after are people that are uh, illicit dealers that are selling to youth at schools, right, through social media sources. You know, we don't have to turn very far. We can look at British Columbia, where the police department seized you know, hundreds of thousands of vaping products that were targeted to youth um, through social media uh, sales like Snapchat. So it's clear to us that the illicit market is targeting our kids. And if a flavor ban is imposed, there's no doubt that this minister is going to send a multi-billion dollar industry in the hands of the illicit trade. That's right, Sam. I mean, it's, it's not really a guess when it comes to illicit market and black market. If the flavor ban happens, we're going to see more of this. And this is actually a story um, out of Victoria from just uh, this past month here in March. Man with gang connections arrested after vape sold to Victoria area students. And the Victoria police have actually previously had warned parents and school officials that there was heightened gang activity and that in some cases gangs were reaching out to youth, to teens, and kind of hooking them in to kind of sell vapes for them as a part of a kind of a gang network. There's no doubt that illicit action is not going to get, is going to stop when, if flavor, flavors were banned. Brian, it, you know, you're absolutely correct here, right? I think what's really important is, you know, there is very little penalties and fines uh, for someone selling to a minor. We just have to look at Ontario here. If someone is caught selling to a minor, it's a $490 fine. Um, for most of these uh, illicit dealers, it's almost like a slap on the wrist, the cost of doing business. Well, we need the government to focus on that. We need to strengthen not only enforcement and compliance, but we need to ensure that the fines are punitive, right? The fine should be 10 times of that amount. It should be 5,000 for first infraction, 50,000 for second infraction. And quite frankly, if it's a retail outlet, um, you know, they should lose their license. They, we should tie their tobacco license with their vape license. I think the fines need to be, you know, more impactful. That will deter people from selling to you. Let me play for you again a little bit more from Minister Holland. And I've had enough of it and I'm sick of it. I dealt with it when I was here, when I was at Heart and Stroke. I'm dealing with it again as, uh, as health minister. We can't have this continue to happen. I want the ability um, to be able to restrict flavors only to those that are exactly logical for the purposes of cessation. I want to get rid of, of flavors that attract kids. Because these problems with pouches are, are, are really very serious and we're seeing a whole new cohort of, of young people being addicted to these products, um, in my estimation, these need to be moved behind the counter because they represent a clear and present threat to our public health. It had everything to do with trying to create a lifestyle and an attraction to a new product that's going to addict people who have no exposure to nicotine or tobacco as another delivery mechanism to, the, to, to that product, which is an agent of death. I wanted to play that, Sam, because 
he's just referred to synthetic nicotine pouches, which have a very valid place in tobacco harm reduction as an agent of death. Yeah, Brad, I think, you know, I do, I do want, want to point out uh, the minister um, did and not, was not duped. Um, you know, there is no loophole. Um, you know, those experts in the, uh, those experts uh, in the field understand in regards to harm reduction and, and, and uh, natural health product knows that there was a pathway to obtain approval, right? Uh, there's a lot of testing that needs to be done. A lot of efficacy needs to be proven. I think what uh, is really important for the minister to, to understand is that um, with natural health product and NRTs, um, there needs to be further restrictions. I don't understand why a youth can walk into a pharmacy, whether it's gums patches or, you know, or nicotine pouches, be able to purchase this legally. Um, there's an issue with that. I mean, if the issue is on nicotine, uh, under his leadership, I don't understand why there was no age restrictions. And most important thing, before nicotine pouches were approved, this was a major concern. Um, you know, I do want to highlight, I mean, tobacco companies were the ones that have this product ready for market. I, I don't understand why under his leadership that, you know, uh, in regards to marketing or promotion uh, regulations, why, why wasn't that put in place? Um why after the product was launched and then they had an uh, issue with it. I think most important thing is before you can market and advertise a NHP product, um, I believe what I heard from the tobacco companies was that they had to present what they were, uh, what they were doing uh, and it was approved. And I, I don't understand why uh, he's making it seem like, you know, that, uh, you know, these companies or tobacco companies are taking full advantage. I mean, there's, you know, I think that there's a reflection to that. I think clearly there are some um, organizations, we'll just call them the five NGOs, made a, made a complaint in regards to um, how the products are being sold. But I think these these are regulations that, that were drafted by the, by a current government, right? So why was it not addressed at an early stage uh, before the product was allowed uh, allowed to be launched or approved for, for, for market authorization? It's not as if uh, the vaping market, the nicotine vaping market in Canada isn't legal. It's a legal market, highly regulated, is it not? Absolutely, Brent. I think vaping is probably one of the most highly regulated, restrictive product in Canada. We have four regulations that govern under the Tobacco Vaping Products Act. Uh, when it comes to you know youth appealing, there's labeling and packaging regulations, there's marketing promotions regulations that prohibit um, any uh, youth appealing images or or marketing ability at all. Brian, let me ask you, when was the last time you seen a vape ad here in Canada? Years. Probably not for a while. Well, I mean, exactly. I mean, not only do we have federal regulations, we have provincial regulations that prohibit any type of ad advertisement that could be seen by youth, right? The only place that you could see a vaping product is if you go into an age restricted uh, specialty vape store, that's the only uh, that's the only time when you could see it. And I think what's really important to highlight, you know, I see this all the time in terms of what the NGOs post, the five uh, classic NGOs post is that they always like to use American advertisement that has nothing to do with Canada. Uh, you know, I can't speak on behalf of the United States, but they don't have those regulations that we have here in Canada. Canada has actually one of the best regulations when it comes to vaping uh, globally. And I think they need to be recognized for that. Sam, the health NGOs in Canada have played a big role in pushing for a flavor ban for some time now. We're talking about heart and stroke, cancer, lung, etc. Indeed, actually, these NGOs actually took out a full page ad in the Hill Times, which is the de facto uh, paper of record in Ottawa for lawmakers and bureaucrats. And this ad was directly pressuring the health minister to ban flavors. The ad is signed by Action on Smoking and Health, the Canadian Cancer Society, the Canadian Lung Association, the Quebec Coalition for Tobacco Control, Heart and Stroke, and Physicians for Smoke-Free Canada. They call on the federal government to ban flavors and vaping products including mint and menthol, 
tobacco flavor would be the only flavor that they would allow. What do you think of this ad and this tactic? First of all, Brad, I'd like to point out this ad is illegal. There's no health warning and vaping products are being advertised, right? Um, a reminder, NGOs, they're not free to advertise vaping products without meeting regulatory requirements. Uh, there's no doubt that the minister is being pressured by these health organizations. I think what's really important is we need to understand why youth are vaping and more emphasis on education uh, is needed. Um, you know, going back to the CTNS data, um, the number one reason why youth vape is reduced to reduce stress, um, anxiety, depression, mental, emotional health, uh, social influence, desire to fit in, curiosity. So we really need to understand why youth are vaping and create a way for parents, uh, teachers, coaches to have that conversation, understand why they're taking it. And, and there's an approach to that. Uh, and I, I think that we we can't, you know, blame the entire industry where the industry is complying with regulations. It's not the industry targeting youth. So I think it's really important to to address that, that we need to focus on how how do how do we strike that balance to ensure vaping remains viable for the 1.3 million adults are vaping today, and as well as striking a balance in terms of how do, how do we educate youth in regards to vaping. So let me play one more uh, soundbite here from Minister Holland. Um, and I think for some who, if they haven't seen this, might get a bit startled. How do you know that what you're doing today with the nicotine patches, pouches, excuse me, won't result in some sort of legal action? For Whatever you? dark corner the tobacco industry sh uh, crawls and creeps into to go after our children. Wherever they go, wherever they think, whatever loophole they think they can find, they will meet me like an iron wall. And so I'm saying through you to the tobacco company, if you do not hear in my voice the concrete nature of the action we will take to meet you, to stop you from going after our children, then you do not understand my determination. I am sick of it. I am absolutely sick of it, watching and talking to parents dealing with sick children who've been addicted to these products, who've had their reward systems hijacked because they've got companies using their billions of dollars to addict them. It's done. And if you can find some new loophole, you're going to find me there waiting for it. I know you're waiting for me to give you something. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. I know. <laughs> I don't know what to say, uh, Sam, to that. I mean... Big, bad, evil tobacco company, okay, but he's losing it. Yeah, I think what's really imp important is that there's regulations, right? I mean, if we, if I, if we talk about vaping, um, if we talk about vaping, I mean, the tobacco companies um, early on, there's no doubt, um, before regulations were available or, or, or implemented, um, there's no doubt advertisements were in a lot of places, right? Um, so it's really important for before any product is approved, um, these regulations need to be in place, right, to prevent this from happening. But I, I think what's really important for me to really highlight, Brent, is that, you know, you may be upset at the tobacco co companies, but restrictive regulations don't work. And I think, uh, you know, Minister Holland has has talked about this, right? Prohibition doesn't work. Uh, that goes the same with banning flavors, right? If people are not gonna be able to acquire flavors and we've seen this happen in Quebec, right? They're gonna obtain it elsewhere, right? That's exactly what we don't want them to do is we don't want them to purchase them from the illicit market, right? Where we don't know if these products are safe. Sam, I'd like to juxtapose Minister Holland's comments and demeanor with those of the top bureaucrat at Health Canada, the Director General of the Tobacco Control Directorate. RegWatch has sat down for exclusive interviews with two Director Generals, Susie McDonald in 2017 and James Van Loon in 2019, during the height of the teen vaping scare. Let's have a listen. Is vaping harm reduction? 
Well, I really think what Bill S-5 aims to do is really to balance the issue of allowing adults, particularly adult smokers, legal access to vaping products as a likely less harmful alternative to tobacco products, while still protecting youth from nicotine addiction and potential inducement to use tobacco products, all with keeping uh, health and safety of Canadians in mind. Could you clarify a little bit that likely less uh, addictive or, or less harmful? What, what's the wording in the position there exactly? The position is likely less harmful and the idea here is that we know that tobacco products kill one in two long-term users. Over 37,000 Canadians die every year as a result of using tobacco, smoking in particular. One Canadian every 14 minutes. What we do know is that the evidence right now is indicating that that same level of harm is not evident in vaping products. Let me ask you about nicotine. It's always been the elephant in the room. Many doctors have talked to us and said it's not really as addictive as been said, it's been demonized. What's the answer on nicotine? I'm sure you've heard it on, on your program before, but it's not the nicotine that uh, kills Canadians. It really is the delivery device. And in the case of, of combustible tobacco products, smoking, um, it is a cigarette that is killing Canadians. Um, nicotine in itself though does have some potential harms. There are risks to the developing brain of youth in particular, also risks for pregnant women and others, so we need to balance all of that. Um, but it is part of the reason that we are making, um, making these products legal, nicotine containing products legal, um, is because uh, moving people out of traditional, and when I say traditional I mean smoking, out of smoking combustible tobacco products, um, uh, to a cleaner source of nicotine, uh, very likely, as we already talked about, would expose them to fewer harms. Clearly there is a big issue going on right now uh, with youth vaping. I believe you've described it to the industry as an existential crisis or threat. It's certainly a very, very big issue. I actually remember the conversation that, uh, that you're referring to there. It was right after the FDA had called this an ex existential threat. What I was trying to convey to the industry in that conversation, what I think is still true, is that the level of concern here is just as high. In our view, uh, so that was new, I've only been here for about a year and a half, and as I came in, I was taking charge of trying to get that uh, act through, or support our minister in getting that act through parliament. And it was very clear that what we're trying to do there is provide access to a lower risk alternative for adult smokers, um, while still trying to prevent any sort of corollary risks that might happen because young people started using the product right. in the form of vaping. So see them as quite different and certainly for people who are able to switch completely to vaping from their current tobacco smoking habit, less harmful. Vaping is safer than smoking. I try to avoid the word safer because neither of them is safe, um, but less harmful. So Sam, when you hear um, you know, sound bites from these interviews at Health Canada. What do you think? And, and thinking about Minister Holland and how he's approaching things. If you look at Health Canada's latest tobacco strategy under cessation and harm reduction, you will find nicotine replacement therapy as one of the tools, but you will also find vaping as the other tool. It's clear that Health Canada recognized that vaping has an important role to get Canada to become smoke-free in the future. Um, and it's very clear 1.3 million adults are vaping today. Yeah, we, it's right here in Health Canada's tobacco strategy. It says vaping is less harmful than smoking. Completely replacing cigarettes with a vaping product will significantly reduce a smoker's exposure to toxic and cancer-causing chemicals. Adults can access vaping products containing nicotine as a less harmful alternative to smoking. And this is the 2022-2023 Canada's tobacco strategy. So it's clear that Health Canada, you know, believes in these products to the extent that, you know, they're saying that they're much less harmful and promoting them. Brent, it's, it's because Health Canada is following the science. Uh, the science is there, fast forward today. I know in the in 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 the past uh, there was a lot of debate in regards to we just don't know enough about these products. I think I've heard this from uh, Minister Holland before, uh, but we do. Um, you know, if we look at uh, the efficacy study that was recently uh, done by McGill University uh, uh, in partnership with General uh, Jewish General Hospital, they determined that vaping is far more efficacious than 
nicotine replacement therapy uh, in their conclusion. So we can't ignore, this is a Canadian study. I mean, the science is there um, and we have to follow the science. And I'm hoping Minister Holland will follow the science when it comes to uh, putting forward regulations. Sam, when I look at um, the sound bites with uh, Minister Holland, I, I can't help but think that there's some kind of an emotional reason why um, he's taking this on. You've worked a lot with government. You know, tell us, I mean, are you getting that sense from CRA and Health Canada and all the other branches of government you work with? No, absolutely not. I, I think um, um, the minister, of course, uh, has a close relationship with heart and stroke. Um, and there may be some influence there. There's no doubt about that. If I if I look at all the, uh, uh, I guess, government authorities that we work with, absolutely not. I think, uh, you know, whether it's Health Canada, CRA, CBSA, I think we all want to ensure that the legal, highly regulated industry complies. Everyone understand what the rules are. And we do our best to support and facilitate with government so that the legal industry can thrive. What we don't want to see is restrictive regulations that uh, impact the legal industry in a negative way and completely drive this industry uh, in a direction that we don't want to see it go, right? I think there is a growing illicit market and there would be for a lot of things, whether it's alcohol, cannabis, tobacco, when you have a you know multi-billion dollar industry, there's no doubt that you know, some really bad people are going to want to get their hands on it. What we need to do is we need to work together uh, and come up with solutions and tackle all these issues. One of the very important things, Brett, is um, over a year ago, I was invited by the government of Canada I, through um, the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, Carolyn Bennett, um, to participate in the cannabis review. And one of the important things I want to highlight is that we sat together with all key stakeholders and we ensure that we have the best regulations, right? Whether it's uh, to tackle issues of illicit trade, to ensure uh, the viable of the legal industry survives, looking at taxation, how's that impacting the legal industry? How do we tackle the issues of pricing between illicit and legal products? Why is illicit products 78% cheaper than legal products? And we sat down and came up with a solution. Right. And I, and I think we, we're starting to see those changes in the cannabis industry where government is enacting regulations to ensure it survives and not hand this over to the list of trade. One of the things I think that often is not talked about enough is that there are a couple thousand retail shops across Canada, if not more, that are small businesses started by Canadians that you know live and work and employ people in local communities that are retailing um, these products. And I'm not talking about the disposables though, you know, some shops do carry those, but I'm talking about the real diehard folks that really help build the vaping industry in Canada. And those shops are gonna close, are they not? Absolutely. There's thousands of independent vape shops across this country that employ more than 6,000 jobs um, they will be impacted, right? All we have to do is look at Quebec, right? When Quebec imposed the flavor ban, 450 stores uh, closed, right? So there is a major impact and flavor bans aren't the solution. Uh, I am i can't wait to see the data in Quebec because uh, I think uh, we've seen in the past when there's a flavor ban in certain province or jurisdiction, what we do see is increased smoking rates. And I think Abigail Freeman's study is one great example of that. San Francisco was the first city to ban flavors uh, in vaping. And what they've experienced is people uh, going back to smoking cigarettes. We've seen that in Nova Scotia, smoking rate has increased there, right, to 12.7%. That's real, right? There is a, there's, a, there's, a real, there's a real negative impact to public health. And we've had Dr. Mike Pesco on just recently this fall. He's actually on Health Canada's Vaping, Assi Vaping Science Advisory Board. And his research also shows the same thing, that there are dramatic increases in cigarette purchases in areas and jurisdictions where 
flavor bans have been put into effect. So clearly then, a flavor ban nationally here in Canada poses a real threat to public health. Absolutely, Brad. I just want to reinforce, right? When you limit flavors to tobacco, mint, and menthol, it's a flavor ban. And a flavor ban is a ban on vaping, right? That that's that's the truth. And you know, there's a lot of data supporting uh, the vaping industry in regards to efficacy, what adults are using. We really need to make sure we strike that balance. Not only uh, I'm a father of three, I don't want my kids to vape, um, but we we have to really learn how we're going to have those conversations if they if they experiment, right? I think those are realities, and and we have to find ways to tackle but not at the expense of a legal, highly regulated industry. A flavor ban also poses a threat to your direct family, your two fathers. Absolutely. And they're, they're the people that I'm fighting for. Um, you know, my, my father is 71. He's been smoking for over 40 years. Um, he's completely stopped smoking. He hasn't touched a cigarette in four years. He's been vaping for four years now. My father-in-law started uh, to vape when I gave him a, a device that was relatively easy for him to use. Um, I just had, uh, of course, uh, new kids during that time. And, uh, you know, he decided to take up vaping and, and, and see if it would work for him. And he's been smoke-free for more than two and a half years. So it's clear that vaping is working for them. And both of them are vaping flavors other than tobacco, mint, and menthol. They do not want to go back to that taste that they've been working so hard to get off of. Uh, they enjoy their mango flavors, their pomegranate, you know, they like the fruit flavors. And for Minister, for Minister Holland to say that what adults are vaping winter berries, I mean, 90% of adults are vaping these type of flavors, not tobacco, mint, and menthol. And there's data that we have submitted to government that can prove that, right? So I wanna challenge the minister, you know, follow science, follow the evidence, but, you know, don't ban flavors because you, you know, your perspective is that it will protect the kids and absolutely would do the opposite. Sam, if a national flavor ban gets enacted, does it pose a real threat to Canada's tobacco strategy? It definitely does, Brent. Um, first off, this will eliminate Canada's opportunity to, to achieve less than 5% by 2035. It's clear there is no other product right now that is getting smokers um, to switch, uh, uh, to stop smoking. If we look at the data from 2019 to 2021, the smoking rate dropped from 16% to 12%. That is 1.1 million people that have completely quit smoking. And if we look into, at the data, clearly there's a large population of smokers and have, have migrated over to using vaping products. And there's no other product that is that is successful compared to vaping at the current moment. If we just look at this, look at the numbers. So vaping plays a very important role and Health Canada recognizes that. So any restrictive regulation that would undermine those efforts is bad public health policy, right? We're not we're not fully doing this for the benefit of public health. And you know, we have to stop using, um, you know, there's tremendous youth vaping and, you know, this is the solution to stop youth from, from vaping. This is it. Youth are going, if they're not going to be able to buy flavors, they're going to either buy, order them online, buy them from overseas, buy them from the United States, buy them from Melissa sources like we've seen. Uh, there's evidence of that, you know, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to have Illicit dealers are going to deliberately target our youth. And like I keep saying, this that that is an absolute um, detriment to public health. You know, it's it's quite sad. I, I think, uh, you know, to see that this has been reactivated because, quite frankly, there's no evidence to support a flavor ban. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of lives that would be impacted. And I think, you know, for our health minister and our minister of uh, mental health and addictions, their job is to ensure that we protect Canadians, right? Their job is to ensure that we protect public health. These policies are not going to do that, right? And I think it's important for them to reflect on what their roles are. 
threat to the Ministry of Finance of Canada and the Ministry of Finances of all the provinces. They are just, I mean, they're going to be out hundreds of millions and millions of dollars. That's right, Brad. There's a lot of effort that's been put into the uh, excise uh, program for vaping. Um, the impact is going to be significant. Currently right now, um, the federal government projects that we'll collect roughly approximately 350 to $400 million in excise for vaping. With the provinces joining, um, Ontario, Quebec, um, and we've heard Alberta announcing that they would like to join in 2025, that's all in jeopardy. Uh, there will be no excise for them. Uh, it's important for, for the Ontario government to know that this program is rolling out in a couple months. But should the vape industry be stamping a product that's going to be deemed illegal in a very short period of time? They have a very tough choice. It's either they go bankrupt or they pay taxes of the government. I do really want to highlight that this will destroy and this will be a collapse of the excise tax program here in Canada. And no doubt that CRA, CBSA, Finance Canada will all be impacted, including the provinces, because they have invested resources to ensure that they uh, uh, enforce, ensure that the big product licensees comply with regulations, and they have to work with them, right? Um, so there's government jobs are, that are also in jeopardy, right? The, these, uh, as far as I can tell you, there's a, a lot of auditors that are tasked with ensuring that the industry complies. Uh, every vape product licensee um, that they're working with, um, you know, are doing a lot of work to ensure that all parties understand how to regulate us. So is it possible then that there might be allies in the federal government outside of, say, the Minister of Health's purview? I would say definitely yes. I think, uh, you know, we've been for a long time as a legal, highly regulated industry, we've painted as as uh, as bad players or bad actors. Uh, like I said, I mean, I haven't seen a vape bat that, that targets kids for a long time. We do our best work really hard to comply with government regulations. And if you speak to finance, CRA, I mean, they do see that. There's one reason why the excise program for vaping has been relatively successful. All we have to do is look at the numbers, Brett. The government anticipated that they would collect $69 million in the first year, $145 million in the in the second year and a total of 650 million over five years. The fact is that they're, they're already, they've already surpassed that, right? And I do want to reinforce, that's one reason why we're advocating for not doubling the tax rate is because there's sufficient revenue to go around. And at a time when inflation, when the cost of living is so expensive, we shouldn't be further making uh, vaping products more expensive for users. You know, I think what the, uh, the current government needs to reflect on is that this has a major impact on one more than 1.3 million Canadians. These people's lives are going to be impacted, and surely these people are going going to make some of their decisions uh, when they when it comes to voting. Right? That we've seen it. You know, I vape, I vote, um, and people's lives are impacted. They're going they're going to they're going to voice their concerns. Um, so. You know, I, I think we need to really reflect on this is really bad timing to put forward, right? If we're thinking about public health, um, why, right? It makes absolutely no sense. For those consumers that vape, that have chosen vaping uh, uh, over smoking, is to engage your MP, to engage your MP uh, and let them know that this has worked for you. It's very important for you to have that conversation because, um Government's going to enact policy that might impact their lives. So I do encourage that every Canadian, if this is a major concern to them, is to reach out to your MP to express your concerns in regards to this flavor ban. Sam, is a national flavor ban a real threat to vaping? Yes, Brett. Uh, you know, you're going to have the highly legal regulated industry collapse. Stores will be closed. Thousands of jobs will be lost. The illicit market will explode and take over a multi-billion dollar industry and at least a million Canadians will be without their tool to quit smoking. And most important, the government will be out hundreds of millions of dollars from excise. 